Well, a warm welcome back to everybody. We hope you've had time to have a stretch, a walk around, to view some of our pre-recorded concurrent sessions, um, some lunch and a drink, and you're ready to, to join us now for our final panel discussion, which is focused on digital health. I'm really pleased to introduce you to our chair today, Jane Dwelly, who uh, leads at the Chime organisation, who's a, a great partner for us at the Florence Nightingale Foundation as real pioneers and drivers in digital health leadership um, and really helping us to drive that agenda around the nursing voice within leadership and in the digital space. So thank you so much, Jane. I know that you'll have a wonderful panel discussion ahead um, with these excellent presenters and I'll pass over to you. Thanks so much, Gemma, and welcome to the Digital Health Panel. It's been a great conference so far and I'm thrilled to be able to bring this Digital Health Leadership Panel to you uh, to wrap things up this afternoon. As Gemma said, I work for CHIME, the College of Healthcare Information Management Executives. And CHIME is very proud to be an associate partner of the Florence Nightingale Foundation. And this year, for the first time, we introduced digital health leadership to the scholarship programme, working with Health Education England, NHS Wales Information Service and NHS X. And really, there's never been a more important time for nurses and midwives to recognise themselves as real leaders in digital health and start to act as such. We really want to see more nurses and midwives moving into leadership positions, such as chief nursing information officers and also chief clinical information officers. And if those positions don't exist in their organisations, it's time to demand that they do. The COVID pandemic makes the case for nurse and midwife leadership in digital health. We've seen colleagues use digital health to keep patients safe, continue their care while shielding, and also understand infection rates and spread. We've seen innovation and rapid change led by nurses and midwives, and it's time their voice is heard in all digital change programmes. And this afternoon's panel has lots to say, so let's meet them now. Can you turn on your cameras, please, panel? First up, we'll be hearing from Zoe Hassan from Liverpool. She's a leader in the Share to Care, a collaboration across Cheshire, Merseyside, Lancashire and South Cumbria. Zoe's working to share health and care records electronically, manage population health and give patients online access to their records. And Zoe is also a graduate of the NHS Digital Academy Cohort 2. Later on, we'll hear from Katrina Russia from Elsevier, who'll talk about a recent survey carried out globally to see how nurses' work patterns and information needs have changed in this extraordinary year and how digital health has helped in some cases hindered. And Katrina has experience of digital projects where nursing workflows weren't tested or considered and has things to say about that. And then finally, we'll hear from Tracy Collins, formerly head of nursing workforce at um, Global Nursing at Health Education England, and now head of nursing workforce at Torbay on the South Coast. And Tracy has led on international engagement of nurses and midwives through social media networks. So returning to Zoe now from Liverpool. Zoe, can you start by giving us an indication of uh, your experience of using digital tools and resources to improve patient care. Just unmute myself. Hi, everybody, and welcome. So, um, over over the last sort of five to seven years, my 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 role in digital ha has changed. Um, but originally, sort of came to uh, came to fruition when um, we had some unfortunately quite some quite major clinical incidents that were happening across the region, around um, in 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 a space of care. So uh, around all different disciplines, adults and 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 children. Um, where there seemed to be uh, um, emissions in care or, or people had, had just, just weren't receiving the care that they needed to and unfortunately resulted in quite a few never events. Now, there may be people in the audience who've read those reports and, and, and understand um, the depth of, of what went on. But my role um, was as a, as a, as a senior um, nurse at the time was to have uh, to review these RCAs and have a look to see exactly where where um, errors had occurred so it was the it was the nursing it was our nursing colleagues who were able to really help me unpick what had happened in that in uh, with these patients and we were able to review that actually um 
it was the fact that we had our, our clinical um, practices, but then we had our digital tools. And in the middle of these tools, it was a big gap. And what we didn't have was we didn't have a nursing voice to fill our, our digital gap, but we also had our technical colleagues who didn't really have that relationship with the clinicians. And at the time, our, our IT departments and our clinical departments were very different, um, often led by our um, CCIOs, but at the time that was that was a very um, sparse even interaction then you know with with a CCIO colleagues and there wasn't any clinical champions as such and and you know definitely no nursing champions. So what our nursing workforce did was able to unpick with us that real gap that we had between our clinical and our technical. Um, our technical colleagues and come together around the table with um, leads in the organisation and, and uh, our execs as well and, and be able to say actually we've got a big space where our organisations, our clinicians, our nursing staff and our technical people need to come around the table to change unfortunately these never events. And at the time, it was really quite revolutionary to sit there um, in, in a position and, and say, you know, we all nursing practice does need to change yeah we've got to come forward we've got to evolve um, and and you know I know our, our panel had a discussion a little uh, before in our preemie about the evolution of the nurse and actually we've come so far in the space of we've started you know we were very much bedside nurses we've developed you know we've become specialist nurses and now is our time to really go into that space of digital nursing and it sounds really scary but we've been here before um, to, to go through that space so my experience um grew in that real in that space between digital and clinical and at first I felt like quite a quite an imposter in that space you know I, I, I wasn't clinical I, I didn't feel clinical and I didn't feel digital but I knew I, I knew it felt right to be there in that sort of spanner between the two so as my role evolved, we really started to unpick our clinical practices, but also unpicking digital practices as well and really looking um, and utilizing everything we had within within the um the, the digital technologies we had available and finding out that actually where the gaps were in our nursing practices alongside the gaps in digital practice. And that's where we started to develop um, clinical champions and we and we became a real wealth of, of champion groups. So that was my first introduction into that space. And as my as I've developed in my career and now work with that shared record, my role now is to is to make our, our clinical colleagues and, and our nursing uh, colleagues really understand that when you fill out your documentation you're just the first part of a journey or maybe the second or third part of a patient journey and our tech I th we need to use our digital and technology um, enhanced that we've got to be able to share that record so it's about saying when you document in your clinical record where's that going it's going into that space and it's about us understanding and owning that space and it's really exciting time at the moment because our digital colleagues along with our clinical colleagues are starting to recognize that it your digital documentation that you do maybe in your your workplace needs to grow and it grows to inform our patients our patients then are able to see your documentation and make informed choices about their healthcare. And so that space that we sit in, it's actually a space where we're all trying to get our patients to be really owning their healthcare and informing the people who are making the next steps for our patients, whether that be you know, at routine health, scheduled health, reviewing health, or actually repeat inpatients. It's about ensuring that that the information that we share across our digital platforms really do inform that joined up care for for our clients and, and our population of the future. So I hope that's uh, I hope that's what you were wanting me to go through, Jean. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Zoe. Can I ask you a second question now about your most recent experience? in the leadership development space in digital health, which is you were um, chosen, and congratulations on that, to be part of cohort two of the NHS Digital Academy. And for those people who aren't familiar with this, this is a, new, a relatively new um, 
training body um, that came about after the 2016 WACTA review of digital in the NHS, when he came back with the recommendation that we didn't have enough people in the NHS at all to be digitally transformative. And we needed to train up as many as we could as quickly as we could. And Zoe was one of those early nurses to join the Digital Academy. Tell us about that experience, particularly that about being a nurse in that group as well. Yeah. So um, we, I was really quite fortunate that there was five nurses who um, who were uh, come who came together at the Digital Academy. But um, I'm not sure if many of you are aware of that of, of imposter syndrome. But one of the things that we what we did at, uh, at the first residential was we talked about imposter syndrome, and I could very much resonate with that. So you know, not only was I a nurse, you know, I didn't have a digital title. I wasn't a CCIO. I wasn't a CNIO. And I sat around the room in a, in, with, with people who were CIOs, execs, non-execs, um, sat with, you know, people, CIOs that had been very, very experienced. And then there was me. And it, when I first went into that space, I, I wasn't really sure where I fitted because the other nursing colleagues, three of them were CNIOs and one of them was a nurse in the army. So she had a very different role to me, whereas I was very much on my early stages of my digital journey, whereas um, some of my other colleagues had what I considered an official title. So going in and feeling that imposter in that in that zone, in that leadership zone, as well as feeling like that in the digital nursing space was a real um, eye opener for me. But as we as we went through and we, we learned about each other, we learned more about um, different people's roles. So the way the Digital Academy works, it's about actually there was technical people, there was clinical people, there was CIOs, and it was about us all learning the role of how actually when we collaborate together, that is the only way that we're going to make this. And I, I talked before about this space between technology and clinical, and actually it sits very much between that and organisation or our organizations as well so it's where we all come together but when we all come together what we did realize and which is what helped over my residentials my imposter syndrome almost by residential three had disappeared was actually there was no right person in the room on their own we need to work together and every voice needed to be heard and what I could bring to the table and my experiences was actually just as valuable of those who sat in those very senior CIO CCIO positions and so the you know I really felt like um, when we were when we came together in our groups that we were able to have our, our voice heard as digital nurses and that actually we need to underpin you know um having nurses as spe being able to specialize you know advanced nursing practice but in digital because the, it really is an important factor in that we are those e-nurses of the future but we also need to recognize that within that leadership space we are equal to the CIO to the CCIO to our technical leads because and and you know the CNIO role absolutely needn't be seen as we would normally see in nursing to be that almost like an underdog of of the of those other executive or senior management level and I think for 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 me in the room what it did was it earned my respect with so one of my colleagues in my peer group was a, was a CCIO at um, a hospital but he was also a consultant anaesthetist but actually he said to me that his attitude and respect for his nursing staff have actually changed through working with us because when, you know, I can happily sit and talk to you about how we connect APIs, I can talk about open standards, I can talk about a shared regional record, I can talk about the IG governance, I, can t I could speak to you about all the things that in a digital space our CCIO and our C CIO could talk about and, and actually what being in that space and that network does is it really does develop your relationships your self-confidence as a nurse but also for your colleagues making them realize that actually the role of the nurse is equally as important as as the rest of them in the room fantastic that's such a good example and it leads so wonderfully on to Katrina so I'll just come on to you now Katrina uh you're from Elsa oh. 
you just recently carried out a survey globally to see how mm -hmm. nurse work patterns and the use of information have changed in 2020. And I think we're going to see some themes emerging here. Uh, let's see if I'm right about um, the nurse, the nurse voice and the nurse role in the wider health economy. But Katrina, tell us about the survey you did. Yeah, well, it was um, in the summer um, and we talked to over 750 healthcare professionals uh, all over the world and, and at least half of those were nurses, midwives and our allied health professionals. Um, and it did focus on, um, you know, the story so far with COVID, how people were using digital tools, what their information needs, how the information needs had changed. Um, and it looked at it from a practicing clinician perspective and from an education and research um, perspective for nursing and education and research. But what actually came out, apart from the hard stats, was so many um, areas of evidence where um, we may have access to all the amazing digital tools, we may have access to lots and lots of evidence-based information, but some of the most simple things such as access um, are going to stop every single person having access to those um, amazingly valuable and important tools, but they have no value whatsoever if you can't access them, if you're not scheduled to be given time, um, even in the, the, the craziness of the pandemic, to learn what you need to learn to be able to care for the patients or to be able to manage a very different workload and so on. So um, some of the real key takeaway points have actually already been mirrored um, already by Zoe, but also previously today, um, Baroness Watkins stated that the COVID-19 crisis has actually advanced us quicker in six months with aspects of all healthcare, but particularly sort of digital, um, the digital health stream, digital innovation than we've had in the last 10 years. And when I first started working in primary care IT a long time ago, that, that if I would have suggested that people would have been doing face-to-face -face consultations over video like we're doing now or um, sharing information across um, sort of secure networks, you know, it would have been a crazy thought, but actually now um, it has become absolutely normal and acceptable, um, more so say for GPs than other clinicians, but um, the, the crisis has forced the need for rapid change and rapid access to different tools. Um, it's also forced different ways of learning because obviously people have been taken out of one situation and put into another and it's really sh shown us the holes in our systems it's shown us the holes that the organizations have and it's it's proved to us that we need um that that, that digital nurse leadership voice as it were that, to make sure that that things are not forgotten or missed um one of the, the sort of key points that i felt that was really important for us was the, the rapid changes in organisation has led to particularly nurses and midwives having to constantly rethink what they've termed as the patient circuits. So it's not just the I've got to get this piece of information from this system into this system, but it's also the, the, the patient journey and the nurse's journey in, in the care for the patient, where the patients come from, where they're going to and what clinical knowledge um, is needed to support those circuits and journeys. And um, I sort of go back to this shiny, amazing computer system, uh, information resource tool and so on that people may have access to on iPads, people may have access to on wired computers in the office, but that, that's, that's a very different thing to being in full PPE in an emergency situation, trying to access the information you need right now to help care for the patient or to understand that the local guideline for dealing with this situation or to even support the patient's family who can't come into the hospital to see the patient but you need the right information to educate them and support them so with all the, the best intentions the these amazing shiny Rolls Royce systems are only as good as when they've been tested by nurses by midwives working those patient circuits that are changing on an hourly basis, let alone a daily basis. Very interesting. Um, so go on, carry on. Sorry, uh, and then another example, um, 
uh, and it's a very different example, but a key thing to how adaptable um, we, we found that when we know, you know, people are adaptable, but it really comes out when you're saying that the that sudden change is extremely difficult to manage, but in critical circumstances. So, for example, London Ambulance Service recently had a sort of complete system outage, and so they had to go from patient triage electronically to paper. There are plans in place to always deal with those situations and their practice and there's routines and so on. But um, you can't put plans in place for the situation that we're in at the moment. So we have to learn from this that actually our digital tools are are really important, but it's the leadership for, from people like yourselves that are going to make sure that organisations and system suppliers and authors and researchers are able to take what we know now and make this standard normal, um, the best tools, the best information available to the right people at the right time. Absolutely. And your survey must have thrown up some interesting um, evidence on um, mental and physical fatigue that nurses and midwives have suffered in the last seven, eight months. And I'd be interested to hear about that and also where digital may have been not the most helpful um, thing to be using. You mentioned the, 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 the struggle between um, the, you know, the ward and the emergency footing. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, there's um, one of the biggest things that came through was the sense of guilt that um, particularly nurses and midwives were feeling because on one hand, they weren't able to care for their, their I say normal in air quotes, their normal patients. So especially some of the cancer services, you, you know, that change in how those patients were dealt with, but also guilt from people who were perhaps not able to go onto the front line and not able to support patients or colleagues in that way. And um, managers, um, and support staff were trying to juggle that managing the workload, managing um, their staff and the patients, but also trying to ensure that, that everybody was cared for and they were psychologically safe and so on. So um, it, it, that was the biggest thing for me to see that the people, even people working on the front line were then having the fear and the guilt that they were doing the right thing for their patients, but then that how they were with their family or how they, the risk to, to them and their family really came out. And in some cases it impacted um, their care. In other cases, it actually made them even more determined to get the right information and to, and to get into the systems. But um it goes back to saying that that sudden change is extremely difficult to manage. And in some cases it's planned for and dealt with, but, and people are always set to that footing, but none of us, especially not the healthcare professionals were, were set to, to understand that Zoom burnout is a real thing. You, you know, I know Gemma has said that there's been some real technical challenges um, sort of getting this, this uh, conference together, but um, my example, I, I can spend over six hours a day on Zoom calls across three or four different time zones. And I'm not then also working in a clinical setting where I'm trying to, to support patients and families and colleagues and so on. So if I'm finding it difficult, the, the lock on effect for, for what you guys must feel is incredibly challenging. And that really came through. And I think um, it also came across how amazingly resilient people are in terms of people suddenly saying I have got the skills to do this and um, for, from, a, from a technology perspective we always talk about technology projects and how we design things and how we test things and so on but one of the things that I've, I've seen coming out of it is people realizing I'm a, I'm a project manager every day in my clinical work and I do have the skills to be part of leading these digital programs because as Zoe said I know where things aren't working properly. I know where things aren't tested because these uh, people are falling through the gaps or this information is falling through the gaps. So that was a really, really positive thing that um, I'm a project manager in a digital program because I, I know what the patients need or what my colleagues need and I know where the gaps are. And, and that was very empowering for me to see that I could actually work to support people with that mindset to, to, to progress. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Tracy, now you've been looking at um, uh, global nursing when you were at Health Education England and now you're at Torbay as head of nursing workforce. And I think many of these themes we're, we're drawing out this afternoon really apply to the work you did 
uh, particularly in networks of support for nurses. Can you tell us about how that kicked off? It's very interesting. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, so, yeah, so as part of the Nightingale Challenge, um, we wanted to reach out to nurses across the world to test the concept of using social media to bring together into small, small groups of uh, early career younger nurses just to stimulate that conversation, shared learning with a hope and aim to actually empower uh, nurses and midwives in their leadership sort of skills and capabilities but also to really um, enable nurses to actually have a voice around the table and to be able to influence care and policy going forward. So we ran um, small groups across uh, India and Uganda and the UK, and they were moderated groups. So we went on the search of actually uh, finding senior nurse moderators to facilitate those groups because we knew uh, they would need to actually have some sort of support and a, a slight bit of direction in terms of how the conversations um, you know, went. So we uh, worked with Ministries of Health in Uganda, just purely because we had that Uganda UK sort of health alliance. So we knew um, they would be a good place to sort of start with to, to find the senior nurse moderators. Again, with our senior nursing colleagues in India and we had Public Health England um, senior nurses and from various trusts across the UK who were signed up to the Nightingale Challenge um, to come forward and help us sort of with the, with the facilitation. So it was a really exciting time and we really uh, had a lot of traction and engagement from, from the three countries to really sort of make this work. We, um, we, we went out to the organisations to identify nurses for these groups. So initially, the shining stars of, uh, of their hospitals and clinical settings and communities that were going to be the future nursing and midwifery leaders going forward. So we, we formed the groups and they were closed uh, Facebook groups. So they were private groups that were closely sort of administered. So we, we you know, they weren't open to... Uh, to the public, uh, so around you know the confidentiality and sensitivities, so they were closed, and we wanted to just stimulate the conversations to you know bring nurses and midwives together to talk. We know that on those occasions where we can get a grab a coffee or you know we come together sort of as health professionals, we talk to each other. It's amazing how much you know that shared learning, that empowerment, developing confidence sort of takes place. So we piloted for three months. Um, we found sort of initially there were obviously a few sort of challenges in terms of using Facebook, particularly in countries such as Uganda. And they were more used to using WhatsApp, for example. But after sort of some training and coaching, actually the Facebook really took off and they really got used to, to using this um, as a platform. So the, the learning from the groups, you know, we found, you know, there was lots of sort of, you know, engagement, excitement, you know, the nurses wanted to sort of develop sort of more in terms of their leadership, mentoring skills, but they also shared a lot of, you know, experiences, particularly in the community settings. And at the time of the pandemic, you know, that was just sort of, you know, coming to the forefront across the world, you know, there was a lot of sharing of information and support um, around, you know, nursing and, and practice sort of going through through COVID. So, um, so we ran the pilot for the four, four months. Um, it, you know, it actually demonstrated that, yes, we can sort of use social media, you know, to reach out to, to healthcare professionals across the world. It demonstrated that learning, you know, the confidence and nurses were able to actually take some of that back to their clinical practice. And what we're aiming to do sort of going forward now is to reach out further across more countries and to partner organisations together to, again, stimulate those conversations, but actually, you know, introduce some of the quality improvement and some of those real sort of, you know, leadership opportunities, those learning opportunities, so that actually we can have some real benchmarks and learning outcomes as a result. It's such a simple sort of model. Um, of using just through uh, social media and we know now how through the pandemic you know that actually the world has been brought closer together through you know digital technology you know we, we can we can reach out to everybody so so easily so that's our plans for the next steps is to you know roll out to more countries across the world 
We want to sort of expand to more senior nursing and midwifery moderators and facilitators. We actually want to reach out to not just the nurses under the age of 35, which was part of the Nightingale Challenge, but for early career nurses as well, so that we have a whole sort of rich, you know, age span of nurses to bring in their, their experience going forward. So that's our, that's our plan. So exciting, exciting times ahead. Thank you for explaining that to us, Tracy. It sounds fascinating. And obviously something that couldn't have been done without digital technology because of the, the global scope of it. I'm interested to hear from you about the, uh, the other outcomes that have come from that, whether you think nurses using that platform for the first time were potentially alerted to the benefits of digital care in a similar space. What do you think about that? I think, you know, I, I think that came through as the time went on. Um, you know, we had sort of initially, there was, it was a lot of nervousness. And I think, you know, that lack of understanding and aware of actually this is, this is a perfect example of the use of, you know, digital technology. But actually, as we went through the pilot, absolutely, you know, that came through sort of more and more. And, um, and afterwards, since, you know, we've, we've ran the pilot, you know, we've had a lot of people sort of coming forward, wanting to be part of this and absolutely sort of using, using the technology that available available to us. Great, thank you. So we wanted to talk now about digital changes in 2020 and as I said already an extraordinary year full of challenges and from that hopefully some new opportunities for nursing. Zoe what do you think uh, would you say was the biggest digital change that you personally have been involved in in 2020? So from a, from a digital change point, I think my, ours has been that transformation of, ch of, of change of care across our specialist trust. So uh, along our northwest region, we've got multiple, multiple specialist trusts. We're very fortunate that, you know, they're quite contained actually within within a small um, Cheshire and Merseyside, but uh, the surrounding areas, which can be more rural around sort of into Wales and up into Langs and South Cumbria, use our specialist trust. But during, um, during uh, the the pandemic one of the things that we've needed to do is use those specialist trusts as um dghs so we've needed to relocate our patients but because of the shared record and the enhancement of that and, and really joining up all our organizations across the northwest um, and at northwest uh, northwest so including manchester we've been able to look at that utilization and even spread of patients across intensive care and HDU settings. So because we share our clinical information, we've been able to initially, um, the Royal Liverpool Hospital is a COVID receiving centre. So we were able to take patients there, but then evenly distribute them dependent on um, skills available right the way across that region. So it meant that none of our no single organisation became fatigued, exhausted and overutilised where some of our more specialist trusts step down because they you know what we were trying to do was keep the bed capacity as as much as possible and even our pediatric um older hay hospital was able to offer because as we know it wasn't really affected in pediatrics we were able to offer the support by allowing not only for the the um the clinical information of patients but also because of being able to have digital doctors we were able to use expertise that we could broadcast very quickly and very rapidly across all of our organizations and use our real specialist center such as the as, as, as uh, the Royal Liverpool to really inform right the way across that region which was just a fantastic opportunity and, and you know it was great to see it working in action all those things that we've been trying to achieve for other other you know um, problems and diagnoses and, and, and different conditions but now we're able to use it, it's continued. So we're using it. So we're going with a one cardiology platform now where some of our really senior cardiologists from our specialist centers are now doing clinics um, virtually right the way across that Northwest region. And it's really, really continued to grow. And that want and hunger for, to, to continue to, to make it embedded, uh, that technology has, has been fantastic. And what's the patient response been like in your area? So it's been mixed, I'll be honest. So some of the digital responses has been mixed. Um, obviously, we've had so we've had some really um, interesting cases with some of our um, 
you know more um who who we considered and I think you know and I think it's fair to say that we sort of have that we assume our elder generation aren't going to be as tech savvy but I think because people have because of COVID and not being able to mix households they've got onto you know using things like you know FaceTimes and WhatsApp so actually we've COVID has digitally matured that age group as well you know they've become quite tech savvy so that's really been an enhancement what we've seen really across the region um particularly around uh, we've been using attend anywhere as a, as a single platform so um i'm not sure if you're aware but as a region we operate as an uh, integrated care system so we do it once so we we've gone with attend anywhere so the learning that we've had across the regions um has been fantastic also in relation to having um i'm sure you're aware our region has around 97 different languages spoken particularly in liverpool so we've been able to use you know tie into our language line so that's really been fantastic for our patients as well but from a paediatric point of view we've got two major paediatric children hospital manchester and alder hay what it's done is it's really engaged children with their care because children are so tech savvy they're used to talking they're used to being on devices to their friends and one of the one of the fantastic feedbacks from um simon kenny one of the commissioners for children he's actually said you know children are engaging in their care whereas normally we would talk to the adult all of a sudden the child wants to be involved that teenager that sat and wouldn't speak to us is really involved in their care and, you know, in some cases that that really flipped that care around and we're really starting to understand and, and people owning their own healthcare needs and conditions at a much younger age. And so the feedback, although it's been mixed, it's been it's been phenomenal really to see that development and hoping now that that um, we're seeing our clinicians becoming more confident that we can continue that that ball rolling really uh, and really grow the technology what we've been given during this pandemic. Wonderful great to hear that about particularly about the children and the engagement of patients across the region it's great to hear that. Katrina can I turn to you now and let's see what you think has been the biggest digital change in 2020? Um, I'd really echo what Zoe said about the, um, the the engagement opportunities with patients has changed and it's been very challenging in some respects. Um, we see a big difference between what what are called the digital natives, so, you know, so people who haven't had to learn how to use IT. You, you know, I didn't come out of, of college and go into my first IT role being an IT expert. I had to learn how to do it. And um, I think the biggest change is it's it's pushed some people on uh, as i said some of the older generation that we, we perhaps assumed would struggle have, have, have um, really done well but i think also um the, the role of chief, chief nursing information officer and the various sort of work streams and so on it, it you know it's difficult to say it the value has been proved now because i i, I don't necessarily agree that it had to take this to prove it but for example the hashtag digital nurse is always trending in, in various things um we've got the british computer society um, specialist nursing group um fran beadle who's actually got a presentation um on on the, the facebook channel um has been working on a really interesting pro project for the nursing records and so on and it's just brought those things to the surface they've all been going on everybody's been striving to push um, th th this um, in terms of leadership and, and trying to, to become at the forefront but actually it's just allowed us all to lift it up and shine a light on the surface that actually these these initiatives these projects have all been going on for a long time and you know we are specialists and we are leading that nursing informatics um, clinical informatics um, you know in the late 90s, when I started working in primary care, training people how to use computer systems, moving from just medication records into building detailed patient records in primary care, the nursing staff were always an afterthought. But, but actually, they were the people collecting the most significant detailed clinical information because they were doing the disease monitoring clinics and they were collecting structured clinical data. It may have been in paper format and moving on to electronics, but they were always the last people to be considered in terms of training. But 
were probably collecting the most valuable, they'd certainly be considered to be collecting the most valuable data now for disease monitoring and, and population health and, and so on. So I think it's just really enabled us to shine um, that significant light on, on um, the digital nursing aspects of healthcare and the leadership aspects. As I said, you know, we, we don't think we're all project managers of really specific digital programs, but but we all are and we're all capable of doing it. And I'm just glad that in some way I'm able to try and push the, the tools or, or understand what the needs are for the tools in order to, to, to support that. And by tools, you mean things like electronic patient records? Um... Yeah, it can be anything from sort of standardised order sets and care plans. You know, people are going into work in different situations that they're not used to working to. So what, what, what are the order sets required for these patients? Which, but which are the most efficient, get us the information, the results quick enough? How do I start this treatment for this patient when I'm not normally working in respiratory wards? I'm normally working in children's units and so on. So it could be just standardised information and data. It could be care pathways, national guidelines, but yes, very much the um, clinical solutions, electronic patient care records, <clears throat> excuse me, or even the collection of data to then go on to research. You know, um, we collect so much information, but how do we then process that information for it to help in the next sort of 12, 18, 24 months and so on? Great, thank you. So Tracy, I think what we're seeing here is real evolution of the nurse's role, nurse and midwife's role. And uh, from a, a, your, in your new post down in, in Torbay as head of workforce there, how do, you, how, do you, how do you plan to go about making sure that nurses feel confident uh, with digital tools and also can step into those leadership roles in which they can make that change happen? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, obviously with my, my colleagues have, um, have said, you know, I mean, over the last 12 months, to be honest, it, it, we, we've sort of been forced, you know, the technology has been there, but we've been forced to use it, you know, more and more. Um, and I myself, you know, just through my, uh, my role now um, and previously, you know, we're forced into having, you know, we've been Skyping to viewing nurses um, from overseas to come into the UK. You know, my colleagues also, you know, as part of that interview process and, you know, training and education have also been using technology, you know, um, as a means of, you know, sharing, you know, part of everyday practice, uh, developing themselves. It's actually been there all the time. It's actually just now sort of come to the come to the forefront. Um, and, you know, using, I mean, this is one of, the, I've only been in my, my organization two weeks now, but actually I will be very keen to sort of share, particularly the social media work that um, we were doing overseas, you know, with my colleagues sort of here in the organization to really enable them to embrace the use of social media. But I know even just using our, you know, for our media, Crisis. you know we're coming together as you know clinical groups to actually sort of share practice to go through strategies to develop protocol and policy you know it's quite an exciting time and you know it enables us to sort of really focus and come together you know more as a community to actually learn around digital technology and I myself would have never sort of thought you know I, I had any understanding around the use of digital you know in my my nursing career so it's a fantastic opportunity you know, and to really put nurses sort of at the forefront of uh, taking some of this forward. So it is an exciting time and um, it's something I'll certainly be uh, bringing in with my, my teams here in Torbay. Wonderful. Thank you for letting us know about that. And I think from my perspective, um, I'm not putting myself out of a job, but I often think it's interesting to think that one day we won't talk about digital health, we'll just talk about health because it will all be digital and it will all be so enabled by technology that we don't give it a second thought. And I think we're still behind that wave now. We're still thinking, you know, do we have, what do we do next? What's the next technology? But from what I do, my job at Chime, I think it's all about the leadership. And actually you can put the tech down at some point and just say, we need the leaders in place who are gonna be confident uh, in bringing this change about and also adaptive enough to incorporate new policies and practices into the way they work. And Zoe, back to you on this one. As a, di a digital um, academy graduate, what advice would you give to nurses who are really thinking they, that that's something they'd like to do, they'd like to develop their leadership in this place and, that, and become more digitally confident 
as a leader, what would be your advice to those nurses and midwives? So for me, I would say become involved. So ask the questions, ask, you know, so for example, um, you know, I, I do still put a, a set of blues on and you, you'll still see me in a tra- uh, in the trauma unit. Um, and, and, you know, I ask, I ask, even now as uh, when I'm a nurse on the ground, I, I'll say, you know, how does that information get to us? Where does that information come from? When you fill that out, where's that information going? Start to ask those questions, become involved, really go, but you know, go to your go to your senior managers or go to you know your your lineman, whoever it is, and say to them, what do we have available in our organisations? You'll be really surprised about you know the you know innovation that's going on and, and becoming involved. When EPR upgrades are happening, when there's be even if there's even if it's not necessarily an upgrade, but it's a downtime, we're all seeing these tech technologies they're piloting what's going on across your footprint think outside your your you know your ward maybe where you're based think outside your hospital as well you know when I spoke before about sharing your information when you fill out your digital when your digital documentation is that informing that discharge summary if you're in acute if you're you know a specialist nurse into the community who can see that information and actually who needs to see it start asking what technologies are out there become really involved and also as you're looking into your your PDPs there's lots of different things out there and there's lots of different parts to digital that you need to understand and it, and there's lots of network groups where we're we're trying to establish what do we need to have to understand digital I would have never dreamed when I was a you know a nurse on you know starting off in my career 20 years ago saying you know that one day I'll be talking about how we connect care how we use structured data to inform population health how we ensure that you know our patients are able to access their patient portal what does that mean for them never would I have thought that I would be arming our um, our colleagues frontline so our MWAS people with the information that I collect from a patient but what you've got to start thinking is what does govern it so things like information governance asset owner all those things that seem really scary and that you don't want to get into start to make Make, you know we need to be heard in that in that space and the only way we'll be heard is by taking a step out because our organizations although we talk about you know uh, digital maturity I'm sure you've heard of hymns level you know what we're, we're you know we're celebrating hymns level six across the country level sevens we're working with um you know there's quite a lot going on uh, uh, in comparisons with America but actually what we do every day is we don't ask and we don't become involved in that so we just assume oh we got a hymns level seven accreditation what does that mean for your organization what do you mean that they're doing bedside verification on that ward and we're not it's rolled out in pilots we need to start saying well what clinical groups have we got in available and not just sitting back and allowing it to be our you know our doctors and ccios or you know become involved in the research really you know put put it into your cpd training put it into your pdr training and drive you know there must be amongst us um practice educators I'm sure there are people in the in the audience today who are practice educators you know do you talk about record keeping yes we do do you talk about digital record keeping but where does that do we talk about that record keeping and information flow outside of our organizations we need to think start really thinking bigger than where we just sit and think when I'm you know next time you fill in some documentation next time you link a patient or you find some information just think where's that information come from and where it's going to and it and we all have our interests some have as I say our you know diabetes specialist nurses you know we've got our cardiac specialist nurses but if if digital is what you know what you want to be involved in you can feel um, you know that you've got that passion for it then find that space in your organization because I promise you when you find it there'll be a lot of other people sitting in that space when you get there find the voice find the Absolutely. voice Absolutely. And Katrina, is that something that you would echo in terms of advice to nurses who really have a lot to say about patient care and think digital is the way forward for them? Oh, absolutely. And I couldn't really add add much more to what Zoe said, apart from um, there are lots of projects and programmes that people can get involved with inside and outside the healthcare organisation 
we're always looking for people to sit on panels to give us direct nursing information, direct clinical information. Of um, One of the things I'm really strong on is in software development, we quite often talk about what the journey map is and what problems we're trying to solve. And the more I talk to, to other people, I always sort of try and sort of to try and guide people to say, well, what problem are you trying to solve by, by, by this process? Or what, what's, if you solve this problem, what would the knock-on effects be? And I think just sort of getting people to think in a, in a way of what's the journey. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways that we can all get dressed and go to work, but we, what is the most, the safest minimum impact route and then you build from there about how then you add in additional features, functionality, data, support, and so on. But we quite often forget of, of, to ask ourselves what's the safest, minimum, quickest way to do things and then build in. And if more people are getting involved in those, in those programs in the workplace and, you know, when the new systems are being piloted and put in, and are asking those questions and challenge not only challenging the suppliers but challenging the people in charge of the programs because um, sadly I've been involved in some unbelievably amazing IT programs but because certain people either weren't involved or didn't speak out so many key aspects were missed that that that, that makes a difference between success and failure and actually the ability for clinicians and nurses and midwives to have real first class information systems at their fingertips, but because two or three just tiny fundamental why questions weren't asked, they weren't as successful as they could have been. So um, uh, yeah, I, I would very much echo what Zoe said. I would encourage people to get involved, to uh, think about what problems you're trying to solve with digital. Um, not everything has to be solved in that way. Um, the, the whole, you know, smart use rather than overuse and that sort of thing goes back to what I was saying about zoom burnout and all these tools have been thrust upon us because we've got to work like this um just making sure that going forward we're using the right tools in the right way and not having that that technology and digital burnout which is so possible in these times but um we need to use it to answer our problems rather than than give us more headaches I think Absolutely. Thank you for that. And Tracy, coming back to you, I think what we're hearing very clearly here is um, a, a quest for nurses to have their, and midwives, to have their eyes open to the possibilities of uh, developing their license along digital lines. How are you going to um, incorporate that in your, in your leadership down in Torbay? Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, it's been it's been a learning opportunity for me today as well, you know, listening to uh, you know, to, to Katrina and, um, and Zoe. And it's just a fantastic time, isn't it? And this is our time uh, as nurses and midwives to really drive forward change and, um, you know, you know, really step into that digital space. And it's really exciting. And like you say, like Katrina has just mentioned, I think what's what is important is that we use, you know, the digital tools in the right way. Um, it is very easy, isn't it, to get sort of burnout with all our meetings and everything that's happening sort of, you know, on, um, uh, you know, on Teams and Zoom and Skype and social media at the moment. It, it, it can be, you know, far too much. But, you know, back here in my uh, organisation, it's something that I'll really be asking the question of, you know, um, uh, you know, the nursing leaders and, you know, to say, how are we driving forward the technology? There is so much technology that we use within the organisation, whether it's in the emergency department, whether it's on the wards, in whatever departments, but it's important, you know, how actually that we step into the forefront and make sure that, you know, we have the voice and drive forward that change and that we're really, you know, stepping in and using those tools um, in the way that we need to in terms of, you know, sharing that information, you know, and incorporating obviously the patient care as well. Um, so, you know, I will be asking that question when I um, when I go back to my organisation and say, well, what are we doing um, from the nursing and midwifery perspective? Great. Thank you. Just to say that um, and I did mention it earlier on about Chime's work, the Florence Nightingale Foundation. But what um, was most interesting about this last year is that the foundation was able to appoint 13 fully funded digital scholars, so scholars to their scholarship programme, 
whose scholarship was paid for nine by Health Education England and four by uh, NHS Wales Informatics Service. And I've been working really closely with those 13 individuals who are so passionate about digital health and also so generous in their ability to share their learning and bring people with them. And they're all true leaders in my opinion because they um, are so um, convinced that digital health will deliver those benefits we've been talking about today. Fundamentally, better patient care, but also through data analytics, the ability to understand how the impact of our, of our health interventions and also our population health needs. And so I'm thrilled to say that the Digital Scholarship Programme is continuing into uh, the next into next year. And, uh, and we'll be working again with the foundation to support um, those scholars and and develop them in in their in their scholarship year. And one thing we've been doing um, a lot of during this time is um, developing them as leaders uh, per se, just leaders who can um, flex their abilities to make change happen and actually describe benefits. And um, just a, one final word then from our panels about you know digital benefits and, and how you how you would convince somebody to be a nurse or midwife working in the digital space so what would be your your uh, your selling point to them i think um i think going back for me um jane would be going um really going back to saying you know about the evolution of the nurse you know this this is our next time and this is our this is our space you know we've and if we think about our patients and somebody did ask in the chat so i'm gonna i'm just gonna bring that in for everybody but it's about you know it's inclusion so we talk about digitally excluding people but actually this is our time to bring in those patients that we've been excluding from 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 healthcare because they've been hidden because they don't want that face to face and um, they don't want to access healthcare by coming into somebody so having the, a digital front door for people to be able to access healthcare now it's a whole new era of how we're going to provide patient care so yeah absolutely we can't forget that some people still need face to face there are still a lot of things that we need to do and see our patients but it's about saying how can we arm our patients how can we give them their health care back to them to be armed so for us as nurses we really need to think you know think big and think how can we allow you know we, we're trying to create health care fit for the future and nurses have got a huge key role in that but if we can transfer some of that responsibility out to our patients and help them to help you know their, their own health and make really good um, uh, choices then actually that's going to help us to do our Job, but also enable people to access on a multi-platform whether that's you know face-to-face -face, digital telephone whatever that needs to be for them to meet their healthcare needs so you know now is the time to really transform the service you deliver absolutely Katrina last word from you on that just very quickly um yeah um we're in a world of fake news and we're surrounded by millions upon millions upon millions of google search results um so if you don't know where to find the right information how do your patients know what to find how do you help improve patient education and do your own learning to ensure that you're having a direct impact on patient outcomes and improving patient outcomes and you know you just have to do a search on google to see yeah, out of that haystack, one of those answers will help somebody, but you can empower yourself with digital tools to, to improve those patient outcomes, that education, your own education, your colleagues, <clears throat> and you can, you can lead the way in that um, by making digital tools valuable rather than just a minefield of information. Great, very good, and a good, a huge responsibility, but one I think, Tracy, that nurses and midwives are willing to accept. Yes, thank you, um, Jane. And, and um, absolutely, I would, you know, really encourage, you know, the use of social media. Um, you know, it's, it's so simple. It's there. It's so simple at our fingertips. There's so much we can do to form partnerships, you know, networks. You can reach out to thousands of colleagues across the world to actually share, share learning and experience can really make a difference in enhancing patient safety and quality across the world. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us this afternoon for this fascinating discussion on digital nurse and midwife leadership. 
Uh, we've got some questions in the chat box, which our panelists are going to stay on and answer as we go into the break. Uh, thank you, everybody, again, for taking part. And, and back to you, Gemma. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane, and thank you to our panellists. Wow, I'm sure that you have inspired so many nurses and midwives in the audience that hadn't ever considered themselves as digitally minded or digital being relevant to them to actually think about this in a completely different way. So thank you so much for all of your key messages there. As Jane said, we're now moving into a break. And just before we do, uh, just to highlight to you, as Jane said, we are working really closely with Chime at the Foundation and we've actually developed with Chime in partnership a Digital Leadership Academy. And it's a three day programme specifically targeted at nurses and midwives. Our primary group will be our scholars and our alumni, but there'll be a limited number of spaces that are open to those of you in the audience that are totally inspired by what you've heard today and think actually this is something I want to be part of. Um, Zoe described it as a wave. It's a movement um, for us as a profession and, and it's so important that we're right there at the forefront of it. So look out on our website, look out on the Twitter feed for when that becomes open for bookings. Uh, the dates are in February. Um, it's still up in the air as to whether it'll be a face-to-face -face or a virtual um, event, but we'll keep you posted. So on our YouTube channel, as we've mentioned previously, we've got lots of pre-recorded presentations and a quarter of those presentations are actually digital ones. So they're focused on real life projects where people have used digital, various different types of technology to really enhance their service users and patients um, and their women's experiences. So please do have a look on there. And we were due to be joined today by Natasha Phillips, who is the CNIO at the at NHSX, but she wasn't able to join us, unfortunately. Um, so, so she has pre-recorded her presentation and that's also available on the YouTube channel. So lots of information uh, for those of you that want to look more in detail at this. Um, we've got some questions already in the Q&A. Please do pass on further questions and our panels stay online to answer those and keep the conversations going on Twitter uh, using our hashtag, what, what does Florence mean to me? And we'll see you back here at 3.30, where we'll have a closing of the conference from Professor Greta Westwood, CEO of Florence Nightingale Foundation. And um, Greta will be pulling out the key themes of the conference and calling us to action in terms of what are our next steps and how we take our learning over the last two days together forward. Thanks ever so much. See you at 3.30.